Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here. Well, I have an outline of what the course will be. So in the first lecture, I'm just going to give an overview of um, basically what we introduced in 2009. Um, it's joint work with Stefan Wenger, and it builds upon the work of Ambrosio Kirchheim. So it'll just be an overview of what the ideas are. And then um, in lecture two, I have to teach the Ambrosio Kirchheim theory thoroughly so that you, we can you apply it and you'll really understand the rigorous definitions of everything. And in lecture three, then I'll come back to the um, definition of intrinsic flat distance between integral current spaces, which is a more generalized notion than manifolds. And we will, um, using the ambrosio kirchheim theory in order to describe it in detail. The fourth lecture will be applications related to non-negative scalar curvature and positive scalar curvature that have appeared in joint work with Lee, Lefloc, Huang Li and Laxian, and um, also some questions that Gromov posed. And in the fifth lecture, I'll talk about some various theorems that are proven. If you have intrinsic flat convergence, what can you get from that? So there are Zell, Scully, and Bolzano Weierstrass type theorems. So um, let's just start with convergence of Riemannian manifolds. Um, the first notion of convergence is C1 alpha convergence. Uh, it's introduced by Cheeger. Uh, the limits are C1 alpha manifolds, which are diffeomorphic to the sequence of manifolds. So you end up choosing a subsequence. They all end up to be diffeomorphic with each other. Um, Cheeger proved the compactness theorem that if the sectional curvature is bounded on two sides, the volume is bounded below and the diameter is less than or equal to Z, then a subsequence converges in the C1 alpha sense, which includes the fact that the, um, given any sequence of such manifolds, there is only finitely many different C1 alpha diffeomorphism types. So he chooses, goes to that finite chooses, you know, by pigeonhole, repeat one of them, and then actually you get a convergent sequence. There's also Anderson's compactness theorem, which is if the Ricci curvature is bounded on two sides and the injectivity radius is bounded below and the diameter is bounded above, then a subsequence converges in the C1 alpha sense. So C1 alpha convergence is saying you have a, a C1 alpha map from the one manifold to the other, it pulls back the metric tensor onto the limit space, and the metric tensors converge in the C1 alpha sense. This uh, injectivity radius bound that's required in Anderson's compactness is a consequence of Cheeger's. Yes? C1 alpha convergence is saying you have a sequence of manifolds with a metric tensor, and the manifolds change, and the metric tensor changes. And then um, as a consequence of these conditions, it will turn out to be only finitely many diffeomorphism types. So you have pigeonhole, and one will have to repeat for a subsequence. Once you're in the same class of diffeomorphism types, then what you do is you pull back the metric tensor, and the metric tensor converges to C1 alpha. Yeah. So this, they end up being C1 alpha diffeomorphic, and the limit spaces are actually C1 alpha manifolds, so the charts are C1 alpha. Not C2. Okay. <laughs> right. So they, okay. So the um, injectivity radius bound in Anderson's is a consequence of Cheeger's conditions. Cheeker's conditions will give you the injectivity radius bound. And then in Anderson's case, he needs to require it because the Ricci bound loosened up the, um, the conditions too much to just have volume. All right, so that's the oldest notion of convergence for Riemannian manifolds. Um, Gromov Hausdorff convergence, um, now you take a sequence of Riemannian manifolds and you think of them as metric spaces. So you have a, a distance on them, and the distance is defined as infimum of the length of all curves. And so you have the, you, you, boot, you view your Riemannian manifold as a metric space. I will define it precisely later in the talk. Um, and uh, the limits are then just compact geodesic metric spaces. So the limit's a metric space, and it has a length minimizing curve between every pair of points. And the length of the curve is equal to the distance between the points. So that's what a geodesic metric space is. So this is perfect for Alexandrov geometry. The topology and the dimension can change in the limit. And it is not a manifold anymore. I'll have a few pictures of what these sort of things look like. Gromov's compactness theorem only requires the Ricci bounded below by a negative constant and the diameter bounded above. There's also a version of the Gromov compactness theorem when the sequence is geodesic metric spaces, which involve counting balls, which I will discuss later in this talk. The intrinsic flat convergence. The limit spaces are weighted, oriented, countably HM rectifiable spaces. So these are spaces that um, they are covered by Bilipschitz charts. 
except uh, measure of HM measure zero set. So they miss an HM measure zero set. Um, and the, the limits have a notion of a weight, which is integer weighted. This one is, okay, so the integer weights, and there's an orientation on all these charts. This is the class of limit spaces. And Wenger's compactness theorem says if you have a sequence of Riemannian manifolds with diameter bounded above and volume bounded above, then a subsequence converges to one of these spaces. But also, there's the possibility that the limit space is zero, which will happen if it collapses. So if it's a collapsing sequence, it loses dimension, the limit is considered the zero space. Otherwise, it's the same dimension as the sequence, and it's by Lipschitz charts in that dimension. I'll give this definition in detail later also. So we'll both cover Gromov, Hausdorff, and intrinsic flat in detail in this talk. But the full um, rigor of the intrinsic flat needs two more lessons. So we have to cover Ambrosio here in theory. All right, so let's start with the Gromov Hausdorff. So in order to find the Gromov Hausdorff, we need to know what the Hausdorff distance is. So you have two um, subsets A and B that are sitting inside a common metric space Z. And then you say the Hausdorff distance between them is the infimum of all radiuses such that the one set sits in the tubular neighborhood around the other, and the other set sits in the tubular neighborhood around the first. So they're both close together in the sense of taking a neighborhood around them. Or you could say if you take off your glasses, they look almost the same. Right? So they're very similar. And then um, that's for subsets sitting that already exist in a common space. But the Gromov Hausdorff distance has to be between two separate metric spaces. So you have um, two Riemannian manifolds or metric spaces, X and Y. They're separate spaces. And you want to discuss their Gromov Hausdorff distance. What you do is you take the infimum of the Hausdorff distance between images of them. So you take your X, you take your Y, you put them into a common space Z, and then you measure the Hausdorff distance. You rearrange them inside Z any way you want, as long as it's a distance-preserving map. Phi and Psi have to be distance-preserving maps. And you ha can take an infimum over all metric spaces Z. So you take every possible metric space Z, every possible way of putting them together in common space, and then measure the, the Hausdorff distance between them. So in this picture, you see, say, it could be a sequence of tori here. They're getting thinner and thinner. The Gromov Hausdorff limit will be a ring. The way you can see this is, we want to show that this space and this space go into a common space with very little um, distance between them. What you can do is you can actually just put the ring into this space itself. So this sequence space could be the Z. You put them into the common space, and it, then it's roughly this distance. The thickness of that is just about the gromov hausdorff distance between them. That's an upper estimate. So if you want to upper estimate the gromov hausdorff all you have to do is find a sample metric space Z and a sample isometric embedding, and you figured it out. All right. Gromov's compactness theorem says, this is the version that's for um, metric spaces, okay, here. You have a metric space is xj, and they have a uniform diameter bound, and a uniform number of balls of radius r that are disjoint. So you, you, you say fix any r, if you can bound uniformly the number of disjoint balls of radi radius r that fit in the metric space, then a subsequence will converge in the Gromov Hausdorff sense. The XJs are compact, Y will be compact. Okay. The converse also holds that if Y is compact, if the limit space is compact, then you have XJs converging in the Gromov Hausdorff sense to Y, then there's a uniform bound on the diameters of the XJs and on the number R. And you can do that by saying, okay, if the XJs are near Y, you can use the number of balls that were used to cover the y, they can then cover over onto the xj's. And then the diameter bound would also just be estimated. So everything about the definition of the Gromov Hausdorff distance involves lengths. And so this is very natural. Sizes of balls and diameters are preserved very well under Gromov Hausdorff. Does anyone want me to write the definition of the Gromov Hausdorff on the board? You're all fine? This is a sequence that has no Gromov Hausdorff limit. Here, these are all spheres. They actually, in three dimensions, you can make these with non-negative scalar curvature. Okay, so these are spheres, and they have these wells all over them. And this fails to have a uniform bound on the number of balls because if you center the balls at the tips, and you make them, the blue things are the balls. So these balls of radius half the length of the spines, they won't overlap. And so you get an increasing number of these balls. There's no uniform bound on the balls. So that disobeys the converse. So you can't possibly have a Gromov-Hausdorff limit. 
However, one would like it to converge in some notion to a sphere. In fact, Tom Ilmanen proposed that he would like the particular case where these were three-dimensional spheres with non-negative scale curvature. He really wanted, for purposes of general relativity, to say that such a sequence would converge to a sphere. So he was proposing that there should be some weak notion of convergence where this sequence, when it's at least three-dimensional with positive scalar, should converge to a sphere. So that was a, he proposed that in 2004. All right. The bishop gromov volume comparison theorem says that you have a Ricci bound that's below and the diameter less than or equal to z. I just simplified to say non-negative. You could do it also with Ricci lower bound. And the un then you end up with that uniform upper bound on the number of balls using the bishop gromov volume comparison theorem. So you can count the number of balls by uh, comparing one ball inside another. Then the subsequence converges in the gromov hausdorff sense. And Cheeger Colding did a serious study on further properties that one could have on the gromov hausdorff limit. And uh, they proved, for example, that if you had Ricci and the volume was bounded below, below uniformly by a constant, then the limit spaces are countably HM rectifiable spaces. Actually more information than this. But you notice it's the same dimension as the sequence. Okay, because of this, the fact that they turn out to be so nice, it gives a hint as to what sort of convergence one should hope to define that to satisfy Ilmanen's requirement. It's like, oh, well, the Ricci ones are this nice. Maybe you should have a natural notion. In general, gromov hausdorff limits can have higher dimension or lower dimension than the sequence, and they certainly would not have rectifiability. Okay, it's the Ricci bound that's very important for this. So to define a new notion of convergence, you like to use a, um, have a nice compactness theorem usable in the setting with positive scalar curvature. You want this sequence to converge to a sphere, and you think, well, why not have them be countably HM rectifiable limits? So maybe the class of spaces one should study are countably HM rectifiable spaces. But that might be the natural class of spaces to try to define a notion. And this leads to the concept of intrinsic flat convergence. Flat convergence was defined by Federer and Fleming long ago to deal with minimal surface theory. And in flat convergence, the dimension is kept the same or the limit is a zero space. And the, um, the limits are countably HM rectifiable. And they're weighted, integer weighted. So this notion of ordinary flat convergence here without the intrinsic, just the plain flat convergence of sequences of submanifolds of Euclidean space was studied by Federer and Fleming and shown to have a compactness theorem, depends only on diameters and, and what's called mass or volume of these um, sequences. And they were able to use this to solve the plateau problem and get a, um, a, an HM rectifiable limit of minimizing. And then later people talked about whether they can make it smoother and things like this. But the first level of solution to the plateau problem had been solved with flat convergence. So the idea is, well, we can imitate what Gromov did with Hausdorff convergence. He had a notion of Hausdorff distance, which was well known for 50 years. And he said, Gromov Hausdorff, you put them all into common space and you take infimums. So why not do the same idea with flat? So let's just talk a little bit about Federer Fleming. So. This is so that you can understand what flat convergence is when, when it's Euclidean space. Federer Fleming defined um, an integral current. So an integral current is, let's suppose you're in Euclidean space, the very high dimensional Euclidean space, and you have a k-dimensional submanifold sitting inside this very high dimensional space. And you want to think, what is, this, what is the special property of this k-dimensional submanifold that we're going to worry about preserving under this convergence that they're going to define? And what they decide is how it integrates k forms. So you have a k-differentiable form. The way the k-dimensional submanifold integrates a k-form will be the important information about it. So then you will call it an integral current is the map from k-forms to r, to the reals. So it's a, a current mapped from k-forms to the reals. And then they say, OK, you have weak convergence if the way the submanifold acts on forms, you test it. So you say you have a sequence of submanifolds, mj, integrate mj over a form omega. Does that converge to something? Something that acts on forms. It's not a submanifold anymore, but does it converge to some sort of functional on forms? And what conditions do you need? So that's weak convergence. And they use this to solve the plateau problem. And if these were spheres inside a high dimensional space, this would converge in Federer Fleming's flat or weak sense to a sphere. All those wells disappear 
because if you're acting these, these submanifolds on forms, so think of these as submanifolds in Euclidean space, and you act, how does that submanifold integrate a form? How does that one? How does that one? The long thin tubes are sort of not counting very much in how they integrate a form. So they, in the limit, it's the same as integrating the sphere tested on the same form. So they prove that the limits are actually integral currents. So what they are, an integral current is a countable collection of bi Lipschitz charts into Euclidean space with an orientation on the charts and a weight. The weight is integer valued, that's what integral means. They also studied what was called rectifiable currents where the weights were not integer valued. They, turned, they were able to prove that the, the limit spaces they obtained with an assumption that all the sequence was in a compact set in Euclidean space and there was a uniform of bound volume. Subsequence converges to those kinds of sets, which it's easy to define integration over differential form as long as you have by, by Lipschitz charts. You can define integration. Okay, so that's the key to the first slide there. The flat distance they then define. So they had this first, they had the notion of weak convergence, which I just described. But they also have a distance which uh, coincides well with the weak convergence. So convergence in the, in the weak sense agrees with this flat convergence. If they have a uniform bound on the what's called total mass. So in order to find the flat distance, we need to understand for a current, which is like a submanifold, what is the mass of the current, which is like a weighted volume, and what is the boundary. So we're talking about manifolds with boundary often, submanifolds with boundary. And so you have to define for these currents, these limit spaces, what is the notion of the mass and what is the notion of the boundary. And if it's a submanifold, the mass is just the volume and the boundary is just the same as the boundary of the submanifold. And in general, they define the boundaries using Stokes' theorem. Now, we want to apply this, all this material in a setting where we're going to take every pair of Riemannian manifolds, put them into a common metric space, and measure a flat distance. But everything that Federer Fleming did was in Euclidean space. And it's not enough flexibility to create a, a good system. So in order to study metric spaces, you need ambrosio kirchheim theory. They defined integral currents on complete metric spaces. That's what I'm going to teach on Tuesday, their theory from beginning to end. It's a very important theory, and it's useful in many settings. Highly cited work. Then Wenger extended the notion of the flat distance to that setting. So let's describe what the flat distance is. You have flat distance in a, in a metric space Z between two integral currents. So picture the first integral current, the blue one is, is just a simple one-dimensional one, a path going like that. And the S, the second current, is just a straight line path there. And you want to know what the flat distance is. It's the infimum of the mass of A, which is closing it up to make it into a cycle. So A closes it into a cycle, and B fills it in with one dimension higher. Again, remember, mass is kind of a weighted volume. Okay, it's not exactly, there's also what's called a, an integration factor. So you have this weighted volume of every way you could fill it in and every way you could close it to be a cycle. The A plus boundary B is S minus T is basically Stokes' theorem description. It means you, if you integrate over the set representing A plus the integral over the set representing B, equals integral over the set re representing S minus integral of the set representing T, acting on any differential form cross. The A is in the same class, it's an integral current of the same dimension, B is one dimension higher, and actually the infimum is achieved. The huge difference between this flat distance and the gromov hausdorff distance is that this red and blue set are very close in the flat distance if that yellow part going up is thin. But the gromov hausdorff distance between these two would be on the scale of the height. So this is a way of saying, I don't care about long, thin splines. They're not contributing to things like plateau problems. All right, so now let's do the uh, flat distance between integral currents. So you have um, two integral currents. And the flat distance between them is this infimum of the two masses, such that you have this. And now, 
if, if we can imagine that these are all sitting in the same space, the limit is a sphere S. If you think of the bumpy spheres, TJs is lying directly on top of the sphere, and then your AJs are not needed. You don't need anything to close up the cycle because the, they are together the boundary of the region between the one sphere and the other, all those thin volumes between the spikes. So BJ is this thin region. To make an intrinsic notion, we can't allow any dependence on the embedding of the manifold. So we imitate Gromov's intrinsic Hausdorff distance and take an infimum over all possible isometric embeddings into all possible complete metric space regions. So this is the Hausdorff Institute. So the Hausdorff distance is here. <laughs> um, Jiggly is going to be using the Hausdorff distance for the whole week, also the Gromov Hausdorff distance. So remember it. He said he's not repeating the definition. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, so the intrinsic flat distance, we take two oriented Riemannian manifolds. It's crucial that they be oriented, otherwise there's no notion of subtracting them as current. Okay, so you take the oriented Riemannian manifold, the intrinsic flat distance is the infimum of the push forward. So this push forward notation is just basically meaning um, you pull back the form from the other space over there. And I'll give a precise definition. Um, uh, tomorrow, because Ambrose and Kirchheim, of course, do not have differential forms on metric spaces. So I'm hiding things under the rug right now. Pretend they're forms over there, and you can define this, all right? And femum is taken over all complete metric spaces Z, all isometric bendings. You should think of that as distance-preserving maps, just like in um, Gromov's definition, okay? So just exactly as in the Gromov Hausdorff distance, these are distance-preserving maps. And then we proved um, so with joint with work with Wenger is if M and N are compact and the flat distance between them is zero, then there's an orientation preserving isometry between them. So one thing that tells you is that if there is no orientation reversing isometry on a manifold, they are completely different and their distance is apart. So something like a sphere, the flat distance to its opposite orientation is zero, yeah. We actually proved the infas realized it's a theorem, okay. though. Yeah. Yeah, so we actually do achieve the infimum. And the Z can be chosen to be a countably HM rectifiable space of one dimension higher. Okay, so once, once we show the infimum is achieved, then we take the, the set of the, of, the, of the B, basically. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Where things were actually needed. But for most of the theorems, we use that the infimum is over all Zs because we go over to L infinity. <laughs> so L infinity is a very handy, complete Z. To, and the Korotowski embedding theorem allows you to take any metric space that's separable over to L infinity. Very handy for most of our results. So even this theorem is proven first by showing the infimum is achieved. And then, um, yeah, setting that up. All right, so let's do some examples here. Um, in terms of flat distance between oriented manifolds, um, I have the definition there, and the gromov hausdorff distance definition is here. So let's look at this sample of just um, spheres with a single bump coming out. The gromov hausdorff distance will be a sphere with a line segment attached. Okay, because if you put this and this into a common space, you'd need some little neighborhood around this to cover that whole spine. All right? But the flat distance will lose that spine because that just sort of disappears. Now, there's something called the Gromov square distance, which um, says you worry about the measures, too. And, um, and so in the Gromov square distance, you have a Gromov house of limit, but then you erase anything that's lower measure. OK, so since the volume of this tip is getting small, the, the Gromov square distance goes over to the sphere as well. Now, if you change it a little bit and you make a sphere with a very, very bumpy thing there so that the volume of that tip is not going to zero, the gromov hausdorff distance will again have this line segment. And the square distance will have that line segment because the volume didn't go to zero. However, the flat distance will still lose the spike because the filling volume goes to zero. Remember, you're filling it in with B. So there's this very close relationship between intrinsic flat distance and Gromov's filling volume. Because it's all really about does it get small in a filled way, not is it self small. The B, the B there, boundary B, if he's getting small, that's all that matters. He's one dimension higher getting small. All right, 
So this example, I put the two definitions up. We said there was no Gromov house of limit because there's so many balls and the spines. Each one of these guys is close to a ball with that many spines. None of those are close to each other. They're all definite Gromov house of systems apart from each other. The flat limit, all those spines, if the sum of the filling of all the spines goes to zero, then it goes to the sphere. So you don't actually need the volumes of the spines to go to zero. You need the filling of the spines to go to zero. This example where you have two spheres and it's a thin tube between them, the gromov hausdorff limit will be two spheres with a line segment between them. The flat limit will be two spheres disjoint. But the metric on this flat limit will be the, the one that comes from the gromov hausdorff limit. So the distance between a point on the top sphere and the point on the bottom of the sphere will be as if they travel along that invisible path. Okay, so it comes out nicely sitting inside the gromov hausdorff limit. In fact, whenever there is a gromov hausdorff limit, the flat limit sits inside. But there's many cases where there's no gromov hausdorff limit. Okay, so we lose our connectivity. We, we're not a geodesic space. Yes? Different spaces. Or two spheres where the distance between them is not along a thread. Suppose I took two spheres in Euclidean space and took the restricted distance from Euclidean space. That's yet another integral current space. Sure. Yeah. Sure. All of the and that's an integral current you space. So Gromovs will stay connected and intrinsic flat will not. So Gromov has one of his strongest theorems is how the geodesics converge to geodesics. And here, that is lost. We lose them. So you can have sequences like this, converging to this sort of countable. This is trying to give you the feeling of what I mean by countably rectifiable. It is covered by countably many charts. But yeah, countably many. That's how it can be countably disconnected but not more than countably, which is nice, believe it or not, <laughs> okay? It's, okay, so that, that's an example. The gromov hausdorff limit includes line segments between everything. Yeah, basically this Cantor set is possible. This is kind of a Cantor set. These are disjoint spheres. The metric on them is as if there were line segments between them. No, this one's countably many components. Four, five times four, connected components. It's spheres. Every one of those is a sphere. This one is countably. It will always be countably many. Okay, it's not countable. Sorry. It's like, okay. It will remain countable, I promise. <laughs> Our theorem is that it does remain countable. It is, okay. This is as bad as it gets. Well, of course, it doesn't have to be nice and neat. That's right, they're not complete. I have a whole bunch of diagrams about that issue. You can set up a sequence of manifolds of bounded volume whose gromov hausdorff limit has dimension one higher. Okay? The way you could do that, for example, I didn't bother to draw it because it's too difficult. Um, take a, take a, the lattice of a cube with a thin tubular neighborhood around it. That's a two-dimensional manifold. Now add in every a second or scale down. So it's um, eight cubes two-dimensional neighborhood, even smaller around it. Scale down again, 16 cubes, tubular neighborhood. They're all two-dimensional Riemannian manifolds. The gromov hausdorff limit is three-dimensional and has a, um, a taxi cab metric on it. The distance between points goes like that, falling as if it was going through the tubes. All right? The intrinsic flat distance will never go up a dimension. That sequence will not converge in the intrinsic flat sense because of the mass, the volume's not uniformly bounded above. 
So the intrinsic flat limit spaces are what we call integral current spaces. So they are countably HK rectifiable metric spaces. Um, so that's a metric, just to define, that's a notion that existed long before we wrote our work, okay? These are metric spaces X with countably many Lipschitz maps phi I from Borel measurable sets inside Euclidean K space to X, such that the Hausdorff measure of everything that isn't covered is zero. Notice it's the K-dimensional Hausdorff measure that's, that you use to say that the rest of it is not covered, it's zero, and that those are all um, Borel measurable sets, AI sitting in each in EK. Okay. So phi I can be chosen to be by Lipschitz, that's a theorem of Kirchheim, um, with phi I AI intersected phi J AJ equal empty set, so that's what we generally just do. You're, we choose an orientation just by saying that we have a preferred atlas for these charts. You change the atlas, the same ideas in Riemannian geometry, if the charts overlap you have to have the determinant which would be defined even if it's only Lipschitz as positive or negative. We define multiplicity or weight by choosing a positive integer valued Borel measurable function theta on X. Okay, you might say, what does it mean to be more me Borel measurable on X? It really means that if you pull it back at the phi i's, it's more me Borel measurable on the AI's. No problem. So, only, so everything before the orientation of multiplicity was already studied by many, many people. They study these, um, these kinds of spaces and how differentiable things are in those spaces and things like this. And the only new things are the orientation and the multiplicity. We need the orientation of multiplicity because without that we can't have a notion of boundary. We need the multiplicity because that's actually what happens. Things double up in the limit. So a k-dimensional integral current space is going to be one of these uh, um, rectifiable metric spaces X and D with a T. T is going to be a current, an integral current of dimension K. That's the same dimension as X. And we require that the set of positive density of T is X. So these integral currents are only defined on complete metric spaces. So notice I take the metric completion of X. So you temporarily take a metric completion of your X. You say it's an integral current on that thing, and then you take its set of positive density, so then you shrink back down. We're not going to include the, the port of T. That's too large. Yes. It's a preferred atlas of charts, which means there is a set of charts. So we choose one set, and we say that's the orientation. And if you have a different atlas, you check by saying if they overlap, that it has to have positive determinants of the Jacobian, which is defined almost everywhere for by Lipschitz. So remember that that means this, unlike in Riemannian geometry where an acceptable atlas can just get a little bigger or smaller, we're always using disjoint charts. Our charts don't overlap. If you put another chart that did overlap, It'll only count, it won't be acceptable if this was oriented this way or this. That will switch. The entire space is different. Once you have this, so if you just had an ordinary metric space, X and D, and you said, I, I look at X's metric completion, X bar, and I take an integral current T on X bar, and then check that set T turned out to be X. Suppose I check that. Then Ambrosio Kierheim showed that X has all those properties. Yeah. On our integral current spaces, yes. The ones that are integral current spaces that exist. So I'm not saying that all countably HK rectifiable spaces, okay? <laughs> right? Actually, you can't always put an orientation. You just choose a chart, but it's not unique in any way. And it's not like manifolds where there's only two. It's, it's many, many limits. And you can get really bad limits. Um, you can set up manifolds that go to very badly, strangely oriented spaces. So the, this list of properties that we put on the X is if you just said metric space XD, T is an integral current in the sense of Ambrosio Kierheim on the completion of X, and you require that the set of positive density of T is equal to X, then you have he is HK rectifiable, he has an orientation, and he has a multiplicity. Okay, that comes from Ambrosia Kierheim. T records that information. And if you know the multiplicity and weight, you can figure out what T is. So there's a 
a one-to-one -one correspondence between the T's and the extensor pair. So you can think of it as, if it's a Riemannian, I think I have a slide where I show what my theory is going to be, but I think it's in here somewhere. No, let me go back a little bit. Suppose um, X is a Riemannian manifold that's compact and oriented. So X is the manifold itself. It's a nice smooth manifold with a smooth boundary. X is the manifold itself. D could be the restricted uh, distance from the Riemannian metric in Thiemann-Mills lane. That's the natural one. And P is how it acts on differential form, which is integral over M. So then the boundary is boundary of M. The restricted distance from the Riemannian manifold, not the intrinsic boundary one, and integration over the boundary. So these integral current spaces are just like Riemannian manifolds with the notion of integration of a form. So then you can make it a little less, it can be a little singular, make it a Lipschitz manifold. Still well defined, right? It's got integration almost everywhere defined. That's enough to do integration. What happens if you add more singularities? That's the next slide. So if there's a conical singularity in this, in this picture, there's a, that the limit space is an integral current space. It's a manifold with a conical singularity. Since we said that we had to require that X is set P, which is a set of positive density, this is the official definition for those of you who know geometric measure theory. It's the mass of T restricted to BYR. I will define that on Tuesday, for those of you who don't, divided by the dimension, R to the K, because that's a, to get a density, you take a limit. If that's positive, that means the point Y is actually a point of positive density. When the integral current space is a manifold with singularities, then the mass of this T-restricted BYR is just the volume of BYR. That's just the standard volume. So think of this volume with the singularity. That's a conical singularity. P has a positive limit. So that cone tip is included in X. But if there's a cusp, you don't include this point. It's empty. So that's not complete. The limit spaces are not complete. And the reason is all the theorems I just told you about, the ones here, where I said that if P was an integral current and we said that set T was X, that gave us all these facts, there's no such information about the support of T. So if you wanted to make it a compact limit or a complete limit, you lose all of that. It could be higher dimensional. You lose the Bilipschitz charts. It's only true on the set of positive density. So that's the set you have to use to define what your metric space is. So that means that the, the, the intrinsic flat limit of this sequence has a cusp that's deleted, and the gromov hausdorff limit includes the cusp point. The support of the T is the closure of the set. And that would include the cusp points. But we are not including them in order to have the Bilipschitz charts that are countably many. In this particular picture, it doesn't ruin the charts. But you have to imagine the, the possibilities. All right. So there's our integral current space definition. We have x dt. Countably HT rectifiable metric space XD, current structure P, the set of T is X, and M could also be 0, 0, 0. We allow that because of the possibility of collapsing. Currents can be 0. All the theorems about currents allow the 0 current, so we allow the 0 space. The intrinsic flat distance now has to be defined between integral current spaces, not just manifolds. So before I defined it for a pair of manifolds, now we need to define it for a pair of integral current spaces so that we can truly describe what it means for a limit of manifolds to converge to an integral current space. So you take your two integral current spaces, it's x1, d1, t1, x2, d2, t2, and you take the infimum of the flat distance where you isometrically embed x1 into a z and x2 into a z, so they're distance-preserving maps, by 1, pi 2, and then what you take is the flat distance between the push forwards of, of the current. So you, you don't care about the metric except in defining isometric embedding. The only place where D1 and D2 come in is where you're saying isometric embedding. And then after that, you're saying what you know about orientation, weight, and charts. You push forward the orientation, weight, and charts, and now you compare them with the flat distance. 
Yeah. And we proved that if the slack distance between two integral current spaces is zero, there's a current preserving isometry. So f from x1 to x2 preserves distances, and the push forward of the t1 is t2. This is actually the theorem we proved. This, and then we said, what's the consequence for Riemannian manifold? That meant that the orientation was preserved. The weight was also preserved, but for Riemannian manifolds, the weight is one. The standard weight would be one. Okay, if they're oriented, Riemannian manifolds with boundary, then the orientation goes and the boundary's orientation goes and everything maps nicely. This theorem needs x to be set t. If you allow your x to be different things, then it doesn't really tell you anything. The same thing with Gromov Hausdorff distance. The Gromov Hausdorff distance between two compact metric spaces is zero, says that the two compact metric spaces are um, isometric. But if you allow one of them to have missing points, the Gromov Hausdorff distance could be zero. We are saying there's, we can have missing points, but they have to be exactly a certain way. It has to be the set. All right, so here's this picture again. Which the, the Gromov Hausdorff distance had the lower dimensional line segments. Um, we can actually construct sequence Riemannian manifolds with a uniform upper bound and volume which converge to an integral current space whose completion has higher dimension. So similar to what I said before where you take those tubes. It's, it's very hard to, to draw this, but you can do it. <laughs> okay? You, you can make a sequence of Riemannian manifolds. The Gromov Hausdorff limit is higher dimensional. And the completion of the intrinsic flat distance is higher dimensional. But the actual intrinsic flat limit is the same dimension as the tube limit. It, it comes from making a, a mess like this, but in a, in a filling kind of way that sort of really crowds everywhere. I couldn't possibly draw it. It's in our, it's in our paper, though. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we write it out, what it is, right? Okay. Okay, so that's one of the reasons we had to use this set. All right, now suppose you had a sequence of MJKs, your oriented Riemannian manifolds, and the volumes bounded above and the volume of boundaries bounded above. And suppose that they converge in the Gromov Hausdorff sense to Y. So you have a Gromov Hausdorff limit, and Y is compact. Then we get an intrinsic flat limit who's sitting inside. So whenever there is actually Gromov Hausdorff limit, the intrinsic flat limit sits inside, and the metric is restricted from the Y, from the larger one. So it may not be geodesic anymore, but it's, it's sitting inside. That's the theorem in general. And the proof actually is very easy because we have Gromov's compactness theorem and Ambrosio-Kirheim compactness theorem, and the two together just do it instantly. It's an instant consequence. Okay. Ambrosio-Kirheim compactness theorem is saying that you have a sequence of currents with a uniform bound of mass, all located in a compact location, and the boundary is a uniform bound of mass. Then a subsequence converges, and we're using Gromov's compactness theorem saying that they all fit in a compact place together. Okay. All right, so the corollary is that if Y collapsed and was lower dimensional, the intrinsic flat limit has to be zero. Because he has to be the same dimension, but he fits in a lower dimensional space. It doesn't happen. So he has to be zero, and that's called collapsing. That's discussed often with Gromov Hausdorff. The sequence of tori is collapsing the circle, and the intrinsic flat limit is zero. Now, you could also see the intrinsic flat limit of the sequence of tori is zero because they clearly fill in with less and less volume. Or you can just say they themselves, their volume is going to zero. So remember, the intrinsic flat limit was a volume of an A plus a volume of a B. The volume of A going to zero is enough. All right. There's another way that it can go to zero. So let's look at the integral currents in Euclidean space that was studied by Federer and Fleming. They had the possibility of a sheet sitting in Euclidean space that folds. Now you test it against differential forms. The folded part disappears. So the limit is just the bottom and the folded section disappears. That's easy to see if you're thinking about testing on form, but also it's easy to see if you think about the flat distance because you just fill in the blue part. Very little. So can that happen for, for Riemannian manifolds? Can they fold? The embedding here is not isometric. We have to put some, take a Riemannian manifold and isometrically embed it in a Z and somehow make it fold without making shortcuts. So yes, if you have lots of tunnels, 
So if you have a Riemannian manifold like this and another sheet and you make lots of tubes between them, then we can put them into a metric space Z, isometrically embedded, where these two sheets are coming together. And the filling volume is going to zero. So those are lots of, this is like Swiss cheese there. And so we have this example. Interestingly, this example can be done in three dimensions with non-negative scalar curvature. With non-negative scalar curvature. It can be done because you can use what's called gromov lawson tunnels, wormholes, excuse me, or um, you could call them Shenyao tunnels also, depending who's in the audience. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway. Um, anyway, so that, that sort of example, the, the, in order to make these get closer and closer together, you actually have to increase the number of tunnels and make them denser and denser. So to avoid cancellation, what can you do? So Gromov and Green-Peterson studied the situation. Um, how do we avoid making a small filling volume? Because that's really what this is about, making the filling inside small, uh, or not small, keeping it from getting small. So Gromov had defined filling volumes, and Green-Peterson studied sequences of manifolds. And they were trying to think of how do you keep the, the filling volume from getting small? So they noticed that if you have a uniform linear geometric contractibility function and the volume is bounded above, then a subsequence converges in the gromov hausdorff sense. This is an old theorem of theirs. And the proof of that theorem involves studying filling volumes, gromov filling volumes. So in that setting, since we're able to control the gromov filling volumes, we proved in a, this is in a different paper than the other paper I've been citing. So the other paper I've been citing is JDG. This one's Calcare PDE, which is uses much more, uh, filling volume and measure theory stuff. So in this setting, the, um, the gromov hausdorff and the intrinsic flat limits will agree. There won't be any canceling. And the volume bounded, um, we also get the volume to end up being bounded below using this contractibility function. So contractibility function says that given any ball, um, if your contractibility, a ball of radius r contracts within a ball of radius f of r. It's contractible within a ball of radius f of r. f is called the contractibility function. It's a function, f of r. For any radius r, there's an f of r, which is uniform, not depending on the point. So you can see how it's like the n of r in the gromov hausdorff right? So it's an f of r, and this f of r then defines an n of r. Now, they only need a uniform contractibility function. It has to be a linear contractibility function in order to have enough control on the filling volume. OK, so this, this is. Um, very serious theorem of Gromov, controlling the filling volumes using contractibility function. And then Green and Peterson noticed that, oh, wait, this leads then to a volume bound, because a filling volume bound is always smaller than a volume bound. It's like below. It's like the filling volume of a sphere is always smaller than the volume of the ball. So they, they um, noticed there's a gromov hausdorff limit. And in our case, we noticed that then that will force the intrinsic flat and the gromov hausdorff limits agree. So ordinarily, intrinsic flat could be smaller. It could even be zero, but no, if the filling volume's kept open at every single point in the space, nothing disappears, there's no thin tube, there's no sheets canceling. Neither of these things could actually happen. And so the flat and the, and the gromov hausdorff limit exactly equal. There's not even a single uh, zero density points, not even cusps happening. I think I have a picture of the cusps thing. In particular, you get the gromov hausdorff limit is countably HK rectifiable, which was not known before except for the Ritchie case. That was okay. okay. Now, Gromov and Shigar Kolding, if you combine their work, you know that when a sequence of manifolds has Ritchie bounded below, volume bounded below, diameter bounded above, subsequence converges in the Gromov Hausdorff sense to countably HK rectifiable. Using the details of the proof of this, plus work of Perelman and some Kolding, other Kolding work, we get to prove that also in the Calcare PDE paper that the gromov hausdorff intrinsic flat limits agree in this set case, okay? And the y equals x. So these are two settings where there's just enough control on what's happening to every point. Now, you really need to keep in mind that the previous theorems, the, the ones in black, are applied to get our theorems. We're just looking at these compactive theorems carefully and saying, wow, they actually controlled it much more than they said. And so we can get the rest. Um, Ming, 
Menge proved that um, there's no uniform geometric intractability in the Ritchie case. So it's not a consequence. So if you have Ritchie bounded below, you can have arbitrarily small, tiny holes, if it's four-dimensional enough anyway. The, the Menge examples are four-dimensional. I actually have a picture of his example. Sort of picture. Who next? All right, we have time here. The examples with positive scalar curvature that I mentioned, that we have um, this possibility of making tubes with positive scalar curvature in dimension three and up. Um, so we have a sequence of manifolds with positive scalar curvature. We take two, um, two standard spheres, and you make these tubes between them. You make increasingly many, increasingly dense, increasingly tiny tubes. And the Grumbach Hausdorff limit will, still, will be a single S3 because they're within tubular neighborhoods of each other. But the intrinsic flat limit is zero because they came together. Right? So standard spheres with these Grumbach Lawson tunnels between them. We can do take every one of those tunnels and flip the orientation inside every one of them. Now it no longer fills. The Gromov Hausdorff limit is still S3 because it doesn't really notice orientation at all. It's not really noticing that happen. But the flat limit is a sphere with weight 2. So standard sphere, weight 2 on it now. Um, so you just take all those tunnels and you flip them around. Every single tunnel has to be flipped. Otherwise, not oriented. We think this kind of cancellation and doubling cannot occur if we forbid interior minimal surfaces. All those little holes is making interior minimal surface. Okay, there's a little minimal surface of dimension two around the tunnel. Think of the tunnel is uh, is locally a, a cylinder cross S two, you know, an arc cross S two. That S two is a is an, a closed interior minimal surface. That leads to a lot of problems in general relativity type questions, um, Penrose theorem, these kinds of things. It's a natural thing when you're discussing scalar curvature not to allow interior minimal surfaces. You make that the boundary of the space. You cut it off, and then you would say, oh, no, there's no problem because those all those boundaries, it just goes to ordinary sphere. In the fourth lecture, I'll talk about the scalar curvature and what results have come up. But this interior minimal surface thing is very important. You still would like that hairy sphere to go to a sphere. It doesn't have the interior minimal surface problem because they're just like, something like that. There's no minimal surface. They're not bumping back out, causing a minimal surface. All right, so oh, I can skip this. Let me go to the next. I, I, I'll go back. To, I have another slide of that. Okay, so we have time, so I can talk about this a little more. When we were um, looking, I want to talk about cancellation a little bit. So this issue of cancellation, which doesn't hum happen in Gromov Hausdorff, it's nice to try to understand what it means here. So in the flat case, inside Euclidean space, if you have two sheets coming together, notice that if you cut out a ball there, you have two sheets of a single ball right around the point that you're worried about disappearing. If you look at that sheets there, you'll notice the boundary of that ball is two rings of opposite orientation, and they could be filled in with that instead. That's what I mean by the filling is small. And that's essentially exactly what's going on when it's flat limits going small. This thing with all the Swiss cheese there, that's a, a, that's a ball inside a manifold. And the boundary of that ball is in black here. Goes around the edge and goes around the bottom edge with opposite orientation. And could be filled in with a Gromov filling, which is an abstract thing that says it exists, uh, there's a way to embed it into the metric space and fill it there. With that, which is much smaller, the volume of that thin thing is very small. So that is an example of something with a small Gromov filling. Yeah. No. Because it won't isometrically embed into a common space. Oh, that's the point. Okay. Yeah. One thing to keep in mind, if you have, say, here's two sheets, right? And now we make some holes like this that go from the one sheet to the other. 
we, this doesn't actually isometrically embed into the three-dimensional space that we are looking at here. But if you look at this sort of grid, something like this, just sort of think about it in one dimension lower. If you have a grid, a one-dimensional grid, this doesn't isometrically embed into Euclidean space either. But what it embeds into is like a keyboard space. It looks like a keyboard. Well, there's a button on every one of these. OK? The volume of that is getting small as this grid gets small. And so we do the same sort of thing. This is like our buttons, and we go into a fourth dimension. So we make an explicit filling. Oh, to make all this rigorous about what we mean by saying that the filling volume is small, we have to use a very powerful theorem of Ambrosius here. I'm called the slicing theorem, which talks about if you have level sets of Lipschitz functions and how they behave under convergence. So I just want to give them credit there. To make all this rigorous, we need their work. All right, so Green-Peterson had this contractibility function. This is that I mentioned before. This is the actual definition that the ball BPR is contractible in BP rho of R. Okay, then volume BPR is greater than equal to the V of R, which is actually made very precise in their theorem. Okay, uh, they get a uniform function V of R, and then that counts us, gives us a number of R, N of R, and that allows us to have a gromov hausdorff limit. If the row is linear, then we can get that the X and the Y agree, that the gromov hausdorff and the intrinsic plot limits agree, so we get a gromov hausdorff countably HK rectifiable as a consequence and Schulenwenger made an example to show that if it's not a linear contractibility function, they construct a sequence which has a gromov hausdorff limit, but it's not countably rectifiable. Okay, so Schul is a um, geometric measure theorist, and he, he knows how to make these terrible spaces. <laughs> okay. This is just to give you a picture of what linear contractibility looks like. If it's a cone tip, these are nice and linear contractible. That first ball drawn there contracts in twice the radius, pulling over the tip. That one too, in twice the radius. It's a very conical thing to say linear contractibility. So these sequen this sequence here is all linearly contractible, and the limit is a conical space. The gromov hausdorff and the flat limit agree they have no hole. If you have a, a cusp, this guy, the first ball, needs twice the radius to contract, but that one needs four times the radius to contract. That one needs eight times the radius to contract. It's not a uniform, it's not a linear contractibility function. The smaller the r, the bigger the row of r has to be. And in that case, the flat limit disappeared. It lost that point. Now, there's a nice thing, which is to say, if you wanted to say, oh, this linear contractibility function over there, away from that point, well, yes, points where there's a nice linear contractibility, they stay. Only that one bad point is causing all the trouble. Okay. So you can keep track of what disappears or not. In this way. Okay, this is the Ricci non-negative sequence I mentioned that Menge had proven. There is a sequence of manifolds in four dimensions with non-negative Ricci curvature that have a lot of topology. So this is an important uh, sequence. So what they are are, take um a four-dimensional sphere and another four-dimensional sphere, glue them together on a sharp edge. So they're very flat spheres. Glue them on a sharp edge, now soften them a little bit, and then stick in these CP2s. Okay? That's all those little um, CP2s I drew there. There are four CP2s in the first one, and there's eight in the next, and so on. So you can make more and more CP2s. This is Menge's construction, and the gromov hausdorff limit is just this this nice sharp edge, sharp edge thing. So that's not uniformly contractible. So what can you do? Um, so we show that even so, we're going to have the intrinsic flat and the gromov house limit agree. I don't think I can do this whole proof right now. So yes, I did do that. <laughs> so I didn't give it to you. Okay. So what we had to do is we first looked at the points that were away from those bad things. We showed that most of them are nice because Jigger Colding shows them almost everywhere it's nice. And then after we get almost everywhere is nice, we do density arguments. Okay. So anyway, this is what's going to happen for the rest of the sequence. I just did the overview. You'll find the work in our JDG paper and the CVPDE paper. The JDG paper is the one that has the intrinsic flat definition defined, and the CVPDE is the one with the Ricci and the contractibility. Uh, next lecture is Ambrosio-Kirheim, and I'll also go over Federer-Fleming.
which is from 1960, and Ambrose Kirchheim from 2000. Lecture three will use what we have now to talk about this work in more detail, now that you'll be experts on Ambrose Kirchheim and everything. Scale curvature is going to be discussed Thursday. Friday, um, these are new, this is in a new paper on the archive, and it um, has been applied with a number of people, and I'll talk about the applications that are there. Anything about intrinsic lack convergence is on this 